Hmm. Maybe there shouldn't be a McDonald's in nearly every country on Earth. Maybe the Coca-Cola logo shouldn't be more widely recognized than Sirius. Maybe Amazon.com shouldn't hold more value than the Amazon rainforest. Maybe the cities of the world shouldn't all start to look the same. Alas, these are the outcomes of global capitalism. Emphasis on the global. You see, these consequences reflect more specifically on globalization, a process within capitalism that expands the flow of capital, goods, services, and labor across nations, markets, and economies, facilitated by technologies and policies that prioritize market interests. The long-held mainstream view of globalization seems to consider it a mostly benevolent process whereby our various institutions, economies, and cultures converge to uplift all at the nigh-inevitable end of history. Globalization through capitalism is practically a deus ex machina, an almost magical salve for poverty, illiteracy, and inequality. Think tanks, agencies, politicians, economists, and others have relentlessly pumped out propaganda pertaining to the positives of globalization over the decades. Regardless of its real impact on peoples and places across the planet, its advocates proclaim that the world is flat, that the playing field has been leveled for all to compete in the global market. In reality, the economic unevenness of the world is fundamentally necessary for capitalism to function and is thus exacerbated by globalization. I missed the boat on a lot of the conversation around globalization that dominated the 90s and early 2000s. But those active in those times would know that the margins have long met with consistent critique. While maintaining internationalism, those on the radical or at least progressive side of politics critique the exploitation, environmental destruction, and cultural decimation brought about by the globalizing forces of capitalism. On the other end of critique, the conservatives, driven by xenophobia, resent globalization primarily for its impact on immigration. If you're familiar with my work, Considering all that I seek to challenge on this channel, you'll have a good sense of where I stand on this matter. Though it has receded to the background of radical political conversation, the capitalist consequences of economic globalization persist as a pervasive presence in our lives, exploiting populations and erasing the diversity of peoples across the planet. Before we get into its consequences, we should take a brief glance at the history of globalization. The birthplace and birth date of our globalized world are typically located at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, USA in July of 1944. At this conference, the world's political and economic elite established the terms of international commercial and financial relations in an effort to recover the global economy post-World War II and prevent another Great Depression. Out of Bretton Woods came the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, as well as the centrality of the US dollar, all of which would orchestrate the emerging standards of our contemporary global economy. Much later on, after the end of the Bretton Woods system and after the signing of the Jamaica Accords, the World Trade Organization would also be established. In short, the Bretton Woods Conference marked the beginning of the rise of the Three Horsemen of Globalization, also described as the Unholy Trinity by economist John Kavanaugh and author Jerry Mander in Alternatives to Economic Globalization. The roots of globalization could go much deeper, depending on how you define it. If we're going by the controversial, perhaps overly broad definition of globalization as the process of increasing interconnectedness between regions and individuals, then globalization is an unremarkable outcome of human interaction that can be traced to our prehistoric ancestors. Some find the early traces of globalization in the trade routes of the Mediterranean, the Silk Road, or the Indian Ocean. Then, from the 15th century onward, the phase known as proto-globalization, which ushered in the dominance of colonial European empires from the Americas to Asia, Oceania and incorporated the transatlantic trade and East India Company. Finally, the era of modern globalization began in the 19th century alongside the emergence of the Industrial Revolution. But again, this definition of globalization is a bit too broad. The earliest I would place the roots of anything resembling today's globalization would be in that colonial era. Regardless, our focus is on the economic globalization of the 20th and now 21st centuries, led primarily by the USA that follow the proto-globalized world of colonial empires. Much more can be said and has been said about the history of globalization. Indeed, we can spend hours exploring the complex interplay of the forces of capital and organized labor alike with the outsized role of the USA, all involved in the unfolding of economic globalization. But that's not what I'm interested in exploring today. Ultimately, capital has won the long game, at least for now. Even though we've played a role in limiting the voracious appetite of capital, 
The workers of the world are still as exploited, but now more interreliant than ever, as transnational corporations and global commodity chains create the structures within which we work and meet our needs. So I'm more interested in investigating the consequences of this globalized world and examining alternative approaches to an internationalist future. The advocates of globalization argue that our species has overwhelmingly benefited from the fruits of economic globalization. They lowered the resultant economic growth, the spread of technology and innovation, the lower prices achieved by international competition, and the freer access to labor and resources globally. For me, these benefits are laden with asterisks. I don't consider economic growth desirable by default. An economy should be oriented around sustenance, sustainability, and resilience for the improved life quality of all, first and foremost. If growth is a consequence of those aims, then so be it. But growth should not be an aim in and of itself. An infinite expansion of the economy is fundamentally contradictory to our material limits, and increased consumption and production do not necessarily lead to increased well-being or happiness. I don't consider technology and innovation neutral by default, but rather directly tied to the circumstances that produce them. As I've said before, our technologies reflect a particular worldview on life, death, human potential, and human relationships with each other and nature. Much of our technology reflects the dominant and destructive worldview of our industrial capitalist society, which extols human supremacy, utilitarianism, exploitation, dependence, and detachment from the natural world. Much of our technology no longer serves us, but rather fosters our dependence on them and those who wield control over them. But technology and innovation are outcomes of our creativity, they're not dependent on one particular economic system to flourish. I find it difficult to celebrate the lower prices achieved by international competition. It's said that these lowered costs help people in both developing and already developed countries live better on less money. But reducing the value of goods to their affordability only upholds the culture of consumerism for the benefit of profit, not people. There are hidden and not so hidden costs. The winners of the competition and the blithely shrugged off losers. Goods are made cheap by subjecting contracted workers in the global south, for whom multinationals relinquish responsibility, to abysmal conditions and worse wages, to avoid meeting the higher standards won by workers elsewhere, while folding any fines for environmental devastation into the costs of doing business, thus perpetuating cycles of poverty, reinforcing global power imbalances, and forwarding the true costs of our goods to the planet and future generations. I can't praise the free access to labor and resources globally when the consequences of that freedom under capitalism include the genocide in the Congo, the adulteration of the Andes, the brain drain of the global south, and the exploitation of workers in sweatshops across Asia. This freedom under capitalism is merely the freedom to exploit. The freedom of capitalist competition is merely the freedom to further rig the game in favor of the powerful. Ham de Blay argues in The Power of Place that rather than becoming more flat, to borrow the expression of one of globalization's top advocates, the world is becoming less flat. This is particularly true for those whose opportunities for success and well-being are hindered by the barriers and borders enforced by global capital. While who de Blay calls the globals move freely and command the resources and institutions that run our world, the locals are confined to their place of origin or become mobiles of a legal or illegal variety who follow the opportunities and live within the obstacles meant to keep them in line. It's clear that these extolled benefits of globalization are mainly beneficial to the interests of capital. Is it true that ordinary people enjoy some benefits under this system? Of course. But at the cost of our future? Is it true that we can now connect more to other cultures around the globe? Indeed. But isn't that interaction largely limited to the extent that the culture can be commodified and capitalized upon? Is it true that globalization empowers the free flow of knowledge? To an extent. But if that knowledge flows asymmetrically and under the auspices of private interest, can we truly call it free? For all the alleged gains of globalization, the implication that they could not be achieved by other, less costly means, or under any other order than capitalism, never seems to enter the collective consciousness. That, to me, indicates a limited imagination more than anything else, considering all that we've lost. Remember what I wondered at the beginning of this video? Maybe the cities of the world shouldn't all start to look the same. Along with that observation, I've realized that we're hemorrhaging languages and knowledges vaster than a thousand libraries of Alexandria with every passing year. Such thoughts have me unable to shake the sense that 
our world is losing its beautiful diversity. The loss of our biodiversity is well documented, but the loss of our cultural and aesthetic diversity deserves equal consideration. English journalist and frequent flyer John Simpson once described the rise of the global suburb. Much like the car-centric, copy-paste suburbs that have come to define much of North America, the term global suburb illustrates the growing homogeneity that motivated this video in the first place. Without leaving the existing variety unacknowledged, we can recognize that just as regional diversity was sacrificed at the altar of nationalism, much of our linguistic, cultural, fashion, culinary, and architectural diversity now either rests on the chopping block or has already fallen away. As Simpson lamented, every place is becoming more and more like every other place. With the dominance of English as a global lingua franca and the often prescriptive standardization of the world's most spoken languages, Indigenous and Creole languages are faltering under the overwhelming pressure of linguistic homogenization. Education systems in much of the global south are mimicking the models and curricula of the West, with all its consequences on learning. Western movies, TV shows, and music are holding significant sway over global entertainment, while local productions must either adjust to that palette or accept obscurity. The ubiquity of Western fashions is relegating traditional clothing to the tourist gaze or the realm of ceremony banishing the time when you could have recognized where people were from based on the clothing that they wore day to day. Multinational fast food franchises are gaining a greater share of people's diets, and you can now find a Nestle, Unilever, or Coca-Cola product in nearly every grocery on earth. The spirit of sameness is settling over the globe, while the spirit of place evaporates. Such sameness is conducive to economies of scale, but not the interests of people who want more for humanity than to be discrete blocks of consumers for multinational products. When reading Alternatives to Economic Globalization by John Kavanaugh and Jerry Mander, I learned that this homogenization was one of the key features of the globalization model, as it serves to merge the economic activity of all countries, from India to Kenya to Bolivia, into a single super system of similar, hyper-consumerist tastes, values, and lifestyles, easily served by the same few global corporations. In a word, global monoculture. The policies and trade agreements in service of economic globalization exist to ensure that corporations can freely operate within and integrate all under this system. The other features of the globalization model Kavanaugh and Manda outline include the promotion of hypergrowth, which fuels a relentless search for new resources, new markets, and cheaper labor forces, the dismantlement or privatization and commodification of public services and remaining commons, including water, medicine, and seeds, and the integration and conversion of national economies to environmentally and socially harmful, specialized and export-oriented production and import-oriented consumption. Finally, no critique of globalization can go without mentioning at least some of the consequences of the IMF, World Bank and the World Trade Organization's actions around the world. The unholy trinity is responsible for much of the privatization, integration and conversion of national economies that has occurred since their inception. In the mid-20th century, some newly independent nations were trying to recover from the vulnerable position they were left in by the colonial period through policies aimed at self-sufficiency and diversification in both their industrial and agricultural systems. For the unholy trinity, this could not fly, because local and regional self-reliance limits the opportunities for global corporations to expand into new markets, exploit new populations, and foster dependency. So in the case of the World Trade Organization, they set out to enforce a comprehensive set of global trade rules that overwhelmingly favored U.S. government and corporate interests over developing nations. And in the case of the World Bank and IMF, they made it impossible for countries to access financial aid without the strings attached of structural adjustment. Structural adjustment demands from the World Bank and IMF typically included cutting government spending on education, healthcare, the environment, and price subsidies for basic necessities, devaluing the national currency and increasing exports by accelerating the plunder of natural resources, reducing real wages, and subsidizing export-oriented foreign investments, opening financial markets to attract speculative, short-term foreign investments, increasing interest rates to attract foreign capital while bankrupting locals, and eliminating tariffs to undermine local industry and agriculture. The outcome of all these policies has been felt across the global south, including Mexico, Thailand, Argentina, Indonesia, Brazil, and the Philippines. The losers become landless, cashless, dependent, and hungry when they once fed themselves and their communities, while the winners get to manage machine-intensive manufactories and massive monocultures tailored for export 
as absentee landlords. Self-sustainability becomes a distant memory. I'm far from the first to recognize that this state of affairs sucks. There's a vibrant history of anti- and alter-globalization politics around the world. Anti-globalization refers to the social movement critical of economic globalization, while alter-globalization refers to the movement that seeks global cooperation without the negative consequences of economic globalization, derived from the slogan, another world is possible. However, anti- and alter-globalizationists are not necessarily anti-capitalist. Many are anti-capitalist, some even proponents of proletarian internationalism, but some also just favor the mere regulation of capitalism. These movements emerged in response to the status quo established by the unholy trinity during the 1990s. Traditional unions and political parties were declining, yet thousands were motivated to join the actions taking place worldwide. Such activists were further united as ever-escalating police brutality against them got away scot-free, while the activists themselves faced persistent scrutiny by politicians and the media. There are a few major landmarks in the anti-globalization struggle that can guide our journey along its timeline. In Chiapas, Mexico in 1994, the Zapatista army rose up against the North American Free Trade Agreement for its potential consequences for the indigenous peasants of Mexico. In the 1999 Carnival Against Capital, Protests were organized from Nigeria to Uruguay to Britain to confront the 25th G8 summit of France, Canada, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, the UK, and the US. In the 1999 battle in Seattle, the people of Seattle, Washington, and the US shut down the streets with a series of protests against the World Trade Organization summit. Many today consider the battle in Seattle the touchstone of the movement, as it was among the largest with some 40,000 people from across the US and the world taking part. But it was only one of several large-scale actions that were taking place around the world over the 90s and into the 2000s. Other actions included squats in England, Luxembourg in the Netherlands, marches in Turkey, Pakistan and Switzerland, rallies in Greece, South Korea and the Philippines, and demonstrations in France, Argentina and India. In 2000, in Washington, D.C., USA, between 10 and 15,000 protesters demonstrated at the IMF and World Bank meeting. In Prague, Czechia, about 12,000 people from around the world demonstrated against yet another IMF and World Bank summit in 2000. In Quebec City, Canada, in 2001, thousands protested against the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. In Genoa, Italy, also in 2001, over 200,000 people protested against the 27th G8 summit. These actions were, as Crime Think described them, mushrooms emerging from mycelial network. To continue paraphrasing the analogy, they sprouted from the efforts of a variety of participatory anti-colonial and counter-cultural spaces and movements spread all around the world. Indigenous struggles, squatted social centers, peasant movements, ecological movements and grassroots unions all brought people together to develop meaningful relationships and share discourses about their own lives, aspirations, and problems in spaces, dare I say, radical third places where they could experiment with ways to employ their agency collectively outside the imperatives of capitalism and state politics. The individual spores found soils where they could germinate, and although decentralized, they managed to converge like fungal threads seeking connection on the basis of shared interests. That's how you start to develop a world in which many worlds can fit. Radical third places might also be known by another name. Social centers. Spaces outside of the digital corporate platforms and within the physical realm where we can share space, time and creative energy with others. In places like Italy and Germany, Social centers may be established in formerly abandoned buildings that have been repurposed as hubs for cultural, social, and political activities outside the purview of capitalism and the state. Capitalists, governments, and the unholy trinity will have you believe that the cult of unfettered international capitalism is natural and inevitable, thus making resistance futile. But although our struggles have not yet succeeded in taking down the system, they have demonstrated that working people across the world are recognizing their shared struggle and willing to act against the systems keeping them down. If you're wondering why these movements didn't succeed in their loftier ambitions and what lessons we can glean, Crime Think offers some guidance in their epilogue on the movement against capitalist globalization. They quote David Graeber, who argued that the anti-globalization movement experienced a plateau rather than a decisive defeat because the movement managed to discredit the unholy trinity in the public eye much faster than expected 
was not inherently radical beyond that aim. There just wasn't enough direct criticism of capitalism itself, just the excesses of specific international financial organizations, which paved the way for cooptation. There also seemed to be an over-focus on particular acts of confrontation with authorities, and not enough acts of prefiguration to meet people's needs and build a more resilient base of support for the struggle. As I've argued elsewhere, a successful social revolution can't have one without the other. Since then, the governments of the world have gotten enough practice with demonstrations to know how to handle them whenever they arise. Thus, we cannot keep returning to the same fronts, going through the same motions of the same protests and expecting different results. Other than that, arguably, we could stand to have a little fun. I'm not saying every radical effort has to be a party, but how else will people see that a better world is possible if we don't contest not only the spaces we occupy, but the way that we relate to each other? Kremthink uses the example of the anti-roads movement in the UK, which, quote, created long-term occupations in which people could build new relationships and a shared sense of purpose. The anti-roads movement helped give rise to Reclaim the Streets, which sought to create shorter-lived autonomous zones in urban environments, immediately obstructing and interrupting the way of life that depended on car culture. Reclaim the Streets, in turn, was a major player in organizing the Carnival Against Capitalism in London on June 18, 1999, the first really successful Global Day of Action, which paved the way for the mobilization against the World Trade Organization in Seattle. Crucially, these experiments were fundamentally joyous, affirmative, and creative. Reclaim the Streets organized street parties that also served as loud disguises for the jackhammers that recreated the streets. We need that playful and inventive atmosphere to flourish if we want to sustain our resistance. Going forward, we can try to imagine radical approaches to internationalism that run counter to the forces of capitalist globalization. The effects of globalization aren't limited to national boundaries. Its ripple effects are felt everywhere, so it's necessary to lock into what's happening outside of your situation and develop a critical consciousness. In the past, I've spoken about the need to build international solidarity and collaboration through networks that span regions, continents, and archipelagos. Such networks can be established effectively without taking the time to navigate cultural differences and build relationships with people beyond borders who can connect with their local experiences. Crucially, those relationships with solidarity imply ongoing dialogue, not blind loyalty, to avoid treating other groups as monoliths and to engage with the diverse perspectives that form within them. Beyond solidarity networks, we can draw from Kavanaugh and Manda's emphasis on favoring the local, obviously not in a narrowly parochial sense. I value cross-pollination and want our diversity to flourish in ways that it simply cannot under global monoculture. In this context, Favoring the local means shortening the lines of economic activity and empowering people to control their own destinies. This might look like building local renewable energy, shortening food miles through local permaculture, shortening fashion miles through local slow fashion, and reintroducing the commons. I've already made a whole video on library economies as a viable avenue for the commons, and a component in prefiguring alternative economies. You can check it out alongside my video on organizing anarchy. The point is, we don't have to passively accept globalization, nor solely go through the motions of symbolic protest. By taking and improving upon the example of those who have struggled before us, we can forge a path forward. If we want to overcome the consequences of economic globalization and move beyond it, uproot the global monoculture and unholy trinity, and achieve our social, economic, and political freedom, we need to develop a strategy that incorporates every front of action. There's little revolutionary value in acts of confrontation or non-cooperation without the interlinked acts of prefiguration to back them up, and vice versa. Of course, circumstances will determine how you individually might be able to contribute, considering factors like ability, employment status, geographical location, material resources, social relationships, etc. But part of developing an effective strategy will require finding ways to accommodate as many people as possible. We must define ourselves by what we fight for, not merely what we fight against. Let's not speak only of being against globalization, capitalism, or the state, but of being for people power, free association, and the return of the commons. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. 
Thanks to the seedlings, the saplings, and especially the roots for making all of this possible, including our newest members, Amber Giles and Jadzia. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out my other videos for a range of radical topics. Thanks again. Peace.